Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, up in Beaver County, there's this gleaming, enormous facility on the Ohio River. People usually refer to it as the shellcracker, but that's just the part that we can see. Underground, there's a 97-mile-long pipeline that skirts around the city to deliver its raw materials. And state investigators say Shell knowingly spilled thousands of gallons of hazardous mud to build it. Today, we're with a reporter who's been digging into the investigation and new criminal charges just filed by the attorney general. It's Monday, April 29th. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. Reed Frazier is a reporter for the Allegheny Front. Welcome back. It's been a long time. Hi, Megan. (laughs) It's good to see you, Reed. So this cracker, it's just huge. It sort of floored me the first time I was there. I was a little down uh, the riverfront in Beaver Falls because even from miles away like that, it's just so bright and otherworldly, especially at night. Remind us what Shell actually does in that facility. Yeah. So they they take ethane, which is a sort of a component of the natural gas found in Western Pennsylvania and turn it into plastic. (laughs) They just heat it up uh, at very high temperatures and convert it into something called ethylene. And they convert ethylene into polyethylene, which is probably something you might have heard of. It's like in your milk (laughs) cartons and everything. Do they make like the plastic we would recognize or is it like the component parts? Well, they make little pellets that are like the size of a lentil bean. Yeah, the nurdles. The nurdles, yeah. And they get melted down and reformed into other stuff and other additives are put into the mix to make different kinds of plastics, but they basically make little tiny plastic pieces. Yeah, I mean, is anything about the nurdles and you know the polyethylene um, components, like is any part of it like inherently harmful or is it just that it gets places? That's a really good question, actually. The common thought is that, you know, the reason they put milk in in plastic bottles is that the plastic doesn't get into the milk. Mm -hmm. And it just sort of like you just drink the milk, you don't drink the plastic. But there are, I guess, emerging science about the long term effects on our endocrine systems of all this plastic in the environment in all of our stuff uh, that is getting into our bodies. And so I I think it's safe to say that there's mounting concern that the plastics themselves are not good for us. It's bleak, Reed, I gotta be honest. Um, uh, So I guess- Sorry. So the cracker plant can't make any of this stuff um, for the good or for the bad without this pipeline that you've been writing about for a while. Um, Its name is Falcon. Feels very official. um, That goes through Washington, Allegheny and Beaver counties. What reportedly has gone wrong with this pipeline? Well, when they drill these pipelines, when they build these pipelines, they drill these horizontal, essentially like a well, but horizontally, like 20 to 40 feet underground or so, yeah. um, so that they don't have to dig a trench. And they do this to go like under roads and under stream beds and things like that. And oftentimes uh, they will use something called drilling mud, which is comprised of mostly clay, but there are some chemicals, some other chemicals in there. And they do this to sort of like keep the drill bit lubricated and um, maintain the integrity of the well bore. Sort of, it's a general helper substance in drilling. And they shoot it in under high pressure. And sometimes uh, the drilling mud doesn't just go in the well bore hole, the little hole that you're drilling sideways uh, parallel to the ground. It shoots out of like little fissures in the ground or it just goes into the earth and you just don't know where it went. And that's not good. It's against the law to have this stuff like return to the ground and spill into streams and wetlands. It's bad for the aquatic wildlife. Um, And like I said, it does contain some chemicals. It's classified as industrial waste. Again, it's it's against state law to, to let that happen. And this has happened multiple times on this pipeline. Uh, so so that much we knew, but very recently the attorney general's office 
has charged Shell with uh, another set of infractions, and that was basically that they were underreporting the amount of drilling mud that was spilling uh, or getting out of control during drilling. Yeah, I mean, and I want to break it down for folks a little bit because this was sort of new information to me and I feel fortunate to have benefited from your reporting over the years. These companies like Shell, they keep extremely good records. Like they have really good ways of measuring how much of a substance is being used in any given time in any given way. Um, So it stands to reason that they did know exactly how much mud was doing what it was supposed to and how much mud was maybe going where it wasn't supposed to. Yeah, probably. I think one thing is clear, you know, one thing was made clear in the charges that the attorney general put forth was that a a lot of the employees that they interviewed believed that Shell was deliberately underreporting the amounts because they didn't want construction to have to stop. Because all of this was going back like when they were building the thing too, like as far back as 2019, 2020. Yeah, 29, mainly 2019 and 2020 is when this was getting built. And basically, like if they had, you know, let's say I think one of the numbers was like over 200 gallons, they'd have to call on the DEP, the DEP would have to inspect it, they would basically have to stop for a few days. And it would cost them roughly $40,000 a day uh, to, in added expense to like to stop building their pipeline. And the max Mm -hmm. penalty they would face to just keep going was $10,000. So there was like no monetary um, sort of penalty to just fudge the numbers for a little while, keep drilling, and then later on tell the DEP, oh, it was actually like 10,000 gallons or something like that, or 1,500 gallons. And there would be- Is that what happened in this case? Is that later they like corrected the record? Yeah, later they corrected the record. Like, what does the state do when you do that? Like, (laughs) I mean, they don't really have any recourse, as you said, like the state imposed fee is like much lower than what they would have dealt with if they'd done it in real time. The state did impose- fees for the actual spills later on, which was like under a million dollars, which is not a lot of money for a pipeline. A company like Shell. For a company like Shell, for pipelines, these are very expensive capital projects that, you know, the payoff time is so long, they, you know, it's just not a lot of money. Um, So this became part of uh, an attorney general investigation into oil and gas. It can't, it, there, there were other companies and other projects that fell under this uh, investigation, mainly while Josh Shapiro was actually the attorney general. Who's governor now. Yes, he's now governor, if you, if you haven't heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so, so they investigated it through their environmental crimes division and, you know, put together this, this lengthy record and um, sort of documented all these instances where Shell underreported spills. And the, the way they phrase it in the statute is like impeding the DEP's work or something, something along those lines. And so mm-hmm. those are technically violations of the Clean Streams Law. They are um, misdemeanors and punishable by up to, I think, $25,000 per instance. So we'll see you know, what they consider an instance. I mean, what does the state do in this case? Basically, later on, they may issue a fine. Yeah. And it sounds like not a big one. Like, I'm, I'm not great at math, but like, what is it? 13 charges. So if they get the max penalty, that's 25,000 each. Like, that's still under a half million dollars, like well under. Well, better math than I could do. But I think the key point might be if they thought this went on for multiple days per charge. I don't really know. I'm just speculating here. So please disregard that if, if <laughs> later on uh, that becomes the case. But like, you know, these pi- these fines can get very large. Uh, you know, a few years ago, then Governor Wolf issued like a $30 million fine to uh, a company that was building a pipeline called the Mariner East, which had mm-hmm. a lot of spills like this. And um, at one point, they actually shut that pipeline down. Uh, that did not happen in this this case, but you know the the precedent is sent for sort of max um, penalties for these for these projects. Hey Pittsburgh. 
I want to tell you about a real Steel Town hero. Mary Caldwell Dawson was just the coolest. Not only was she the proprietress of that gorgeous Victorian mansion on Apple Street in Homewood, but inside it, she presided over the National Negro Opera Company. She founded guilds for other black singers all over the nation and was a mentor for fellow opera singers from here to Washington, D.C. And lucky for you, our modern Pittsburgh opera has a new show celebrating her legacy. Get your tickets now for The Passion of Mary Caldwell Dawson at the Bayam Theater through May 5th. Don't be nervous if you're new to opera. The show is in English, is just over an hour long, and features a little dialogue for you to follow along. Tickets start at just $15, and there are all kinds of discounts and special offers for students, teachers, seniors, and veterans. Get your tickets now for the Pittsburgh Opera that's in our show notes and at pittsburghopera.org. Could a closure like what happened with Mariner East maybe be part of what inspired the behavior here with Shell? I don't need you to speculate. I just wonder if that's anything that your reporting is bore out. I can't say what was going on in the minds of the Shell managers. Um, You know, I think it was evident in the testimony that the people who were doing the drilling didn't believe this. these were like very serious environmental infractions, didn't endanger the personnel working on the project and didn't, you know, frankly, just kept kept moving through. Uh, Shell and its contractors also sort of invented a regulatory concept for the during this project, which was um, they called this a managed release or a controlled release. If they're drilling, the mud spurts out and they immediately get a vacuum truck over to where the mud is spurting out and vacuum it up, then they didn't really consider it like an uncontrolled release. And so that sort of like tamped down their own reporting on this. They did, they sort of made it a less severe infraction. Yeah, I, I thought your reporting was really good on that point that like it's towards the end. We'll link the story in our show notes, but it talks about how like there was a vocabulary lesson that became part of this. They like sort of created a different language for it just to avoid maybe talking about it in the same way. It was interesting, to say the least. The DEP inspectors that they spoke to would be like talking to the pipeline guys and they'd be like, what's going on here? Uh, Why is this all this mud getting out? Why didn't you report this level of release? And the, the guys on the pipeline would be like, oh, no, that was a managed release. That was a controlled release. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that serious. And the DEP guys were like, you know, that's not part of your permit. There's there's no nothing called a managed release or a controlled release that's part of the Clean Streams Act, your operating permit, nothing. So, uh, you know, and I pose this to Dave Hess, who's a former DEP secretary, and I believe I can say this on your podcast, but not on the air. Uh, He (laughs) called it BS, that basically they knew what they were, they knew that these were spills and they just called it something else. And it was sort of like an on-the-fly kind of greenwashing that the the pipeline constructors were doing. So interestingly, about that, just on this topic where the, of this sort of invented regulatory term, you know, I spoke to a former, uh, you know, a law professor at Penn State who was a former EPA attorney. I was asking him about why are these just misdemeanors if they're if they're sort of like not telling the truth to the DEP. That seems like pretty serious. And he said that you know it makes it harder to prosecute this case as a felony because, you know, the other side could argue, well, our guys thought this was okay because it was a managed release. They were containing the flow of the drilling mud. It wasn't like, you know, some uncontrolled spill into multiple streams, although some of the drilling mud did get into streams and wetlands. But in any case... Heath seemed to think that this sort of like on the fly uh, reconfiguration of the terms of their drilling permit would have made it harder to to prosecute as a felony. Yeah, I feel like that's so often the consideration in the in the justice system, right? It's not necessarily the severity of whatever the incident was. It's what can we reasonably prosecute in a court of law? Yeah, it's like, what can you prove beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury? And you know the other side's going to have good good representation and they can poke holes in your case. As you said, money is, money is less of an object when you're shell. Not a big object. And, you know, a lot of the people that they 
based their case on were former workers who may have gotten fired. Some of them were whistleblowers. And so, you know, it's it's easy to see a, a scenario where Shell can argue, oh, these these guys were just terrible employees. And so they were like mad that we, you know, didn't didn't want them on our project. So the the yeah. the that was one of the considerations, perhaps, uh, that um, the this former law professor uh, was was bringing up to me. His name, by the way, I should credit him as Jamie Colburn at Penn State University. Okay. Um, well, what happened to the whistleblowers? You know, like obviously this this is not over yet, um, but sometimes whistleblowers don't get like the greatest treatment as they start to come forward. You know, that's a good question. We haven't really been able to get a hold of them. I haven't seen anybody uh, get get a hold of them. Um, so that's a good question. That's a subject for future stories. I, I think. I yeah. I hope they're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> well what about Shell? Um, have they weighed in on any of this officially? Sure. Uh, they they responded saying that they are cooperating and have cooperated with any local, state, and federal agencies, and that they're reviewing the charges. Yeah. I mean, I guess looking ahead a little bit, if it's found, let's say that, you know, they're found guilty on all 13 misdemeanor charges, does it have any material effect to the pipeline now? Um, you know, could anything interrupt it? Is business going to continue as usual with the cracker plant? Yeah, I don't see how that would flow. Um, you know, usually it's very rare to see, uh, you know, a pipeline shut down for something that happened years ago. That would require an intervention from a judge that we just have not seen in Pennsylvania, at least. Um, so the likeliest scenario is that Shell and the attorney general will reach some sort of monetary settlement, and that'll be it. What about you? What are you going to be watching for next, other than court filings, obviously? Well, want to see if there's any more fallout from this, but also... I think going forward, this is a, a good lesson in how the state was able to monitor or not really able to monitor pipeline construction. You know, the DEP relied on Shell to report, to self-report all these spills. And, you know, these are very long and large projects, pipelines are spread out across multiple counties. And so it's very hard for the uh, DEP to be inspecting everything all the time. But the fact that they really relied so heavily on these companies to report on themselves kind of leads to the question of like, what does the DEP do in that case? If, if basically companies can get away with this, except for instances where there's a whistleblower or where by some twist of events, is that a good regulatory structure? And, and for from the some of the experts that I've talked to, they basically say DEP is not funded enough to have enough eyes on the ground um, to to monitor these companies, and that's why they rely on self reporting. It would be like you know you get to work and then you call the state police and you say, "Oh, I was going sixty five the whole time." Um, you could have been going ninety. Who knows? Unless you get caught. So I'm not suggesting that that these companies are sort of innately bad actors, but it's just that the I, the the level of scrutiny that the the regulator is able to put on these projects seems um, you know to to the, to the eyes of many people I talk to seems like there's just not enough scrutiny on these projects, and that there needs to be more um, funding for DEP to quote unquote do its job. Well, Reed, we'll be watching for that. Thank you. We always love a budget tip uh, and for your reporting. Thank you so much for covering this and for talking to us on CityCast. Thank you, Megan. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. If you're liking the show, please tell someone, rate us, leave us a nice review. I know I say that every time, but I really do mean it. It helps. And make sure you're subscribed to our Hey Pittsburgh newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Talk to you soon. The crew is dead. The ship is piloting itself.